Tom Copeland is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ who has been called to teach God's Word on finances since 1982. Tom is a chartered professional accountant who has advised thousands of people, including individuals, couples, and business owners in making wise biblical financial decisions. Tom's financial moments are aired on numerous radio and TV stations across Canada. Tom is the president and founder of Copeland Financial Ministries, who teach what the Bible says on finances. For more info, check out copelandfinancialministries.org. Again, copelandfinancialministries.org. Now, here is Tom teaching and explaining that how you manage money will impact your relationship with your spouse. The topic for today is management of money impacts your relationship with your spouse. Many people believe that how they manage money is independent of or has no impact on their relationship with their, their spouse. This is not true. Let me demonstrate the truth by sharing a typical situation that I hear almost every week. Someone calls me, it could be the wife or the husband, indicating that they and their spouse are having financial difficulties. Generally speaking, one or both spouses have been spending more than they've been earning and accumulating debt on credit cards, personal lines of credit, car loans, big mortgages, etc. As the debts accumulate over several years, this results in stressful arguments between husband and wife. Almost always, the relationship, marriage relationship deteriorates as a result of that stress. Without me asking anything about their marriage relationship, often the wife or the husband will share that their marriage relationship is in serious trouble. What's interesting is this, I do not, any, I do not ask any questions about their marriage relationship. And sometimes I comment that I'm a financial counselor and not a marriage counselor, but nevertheless, they still share their marriage relationship problems. Now, some of you may think, why would any couple share about their mar marriage relationship problems when they go to see a financial counselor? Why would they even do that? I, I'm confident I know the answer because I've seen it so many times. I think it's because the financial problems and the marriage relationship problems are strongly interconnected and most people do not understand the connection. As a matter of fact, most people would perceive that uh, or think that how they manage money uh, is totally independent of their relationship with their spouse. And that's not true. How you manage money does have a big impact or can have a major impact on your relationship with your spouse, both positively but also negatively. And what I see so often, what started out as a financial problem many years ago, which many years ago maybe was just a financial problem, as the debt accumulated and the stress accumulated and mounted and mounted, and that financial problem was not resolved, and has, it's now developed into some very serious marriage relationship problems, which if they're not dealt, dealt with quickly, they could easily result in separation divorce. It could even easily result there. As a matter of fact, about one-third of the people we counsel in the ministry are separated or divorced, and in almost every case, they indicate that finances was the number one thing that they and their ex-spouse argued about. Almost every case, that's, that's what they indicate. Of interest, most of the time, from what I've seen, most of the time there was enough income. But unfortunately, either both our spouses or one spouse were mismanaging money. In other words, they were not managing money God's way. So one thing I say to couples often, do not ignore financial problems because long-term financial problems can easily destroy your marriage relationship. So don't ignore them. Proverbs 22.3 says, A prudent man sees danger and takes refuge, but the simple keeps going and suffer for it. So when you see the financial problems, which is a sign of danger, don't ignore that because not only can the financial problems get worse, and you can lose your house, your car, etc., you can also lose your marriage relationship. In order to obtain a better understanding of what I'm saying, I'm going to give some very specific real-life examples of where couples have made financial decisions that have had a significant negative impact on their finances, but also indirectly and eventually on their marriage relationship. Here's a very common example. A wife calls me explaining that she and her husband are in a financial mess. Among other reasons, the husband purchased a new vehicle with 0% financing and has bought numerous tools that he didn't need on credit all without consulting her and also all without developing a budget to see if they could afford the loan payments. At this point, she is very angry with her husband and without me asking, she explains she has withdrawn from her husband emotionally and physically. As a matter of fact, in some cases, some women are actually quite specific, indicating that they've moved out of the bedroom. And in what I find, this is again, I'm not a family counselor, I'm just a financial counselor. What I find is not too, in due course, since his physical needs are not being met, he gets angry and no longer meets her emotional needs, and as a result, the relationship deteriorates further, and in some cases, it results in separation and divorce. We are trying to avoid this by helping people learn 
God's way of managing money. In this situation where the wife um, phones me and complains about the husband mismanagement of money, first of all, I encourage the wife. I encourage the wife, and also I encourage husbands. If it's your wife mismanaging money, both of you, do not allow bitterness to take hold of your heart because the Bible says, do not let the sun go down in your anger and do not give the devil a foothold. And to the men, I say, be aware that if you buy things you don't need and accumulate debt, it can destroy your physical and emotional intimacy with your wife. It can destroy your marriage completely. And to both husband and wives, I strongly recommend that you discuss your financial plan, that's a budget or a spending plan, before you spend money. Lack of communication between a couple can easily result in major financial problems, which in turn down the road can result in major marital relationship problems as well. So... Um, Keep that all in mind. You may now be thinking, what about an example where the wife has made some bad financial decisions that has negatively impacted her finances, the couple's finances, and of course her relationship with her husband? Um, and that happens too. Here's a common example. The wife regularly goes to the shopping mall buying things that she does not need on a credit card. The accumulation of credit card debt triggers arguments between husband and wife and it negatively impacts their marriage relationship. Over time, the husband withdraws and no longer connects with his wife emotionally. Since her emotional needs are not being met, she withdraws from his, him physically and the marriage relationship ends up in a downward spiral. And unfortunately, when you get into that downward spiral, it, it doesn't stop unless, one, unless both spouses really step up to the plate and say, hey, we're going to learn what God says on finances. We're going to get this right. So ladies, my comment to you, if you spend money unnecessarily and accumulate debt, it can destroy your relationship with your husband. And the same comment goes for the men as well. You need to be careful as to how you manage and utilize the money that God's entrusted to you. Of interest, in my experience, often when we, when we look at people's uh, debt, often a big chunk of that debt relates to people buying things that are wants and desires as opposed to needs. It's important to understand that in Matthew 6, 31 to 33, Jesus said, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. In other words, Christ is saying, Put me first. I will meet your needs. But it doesn't say he's going to meet our wants and desires. Um, it doesn't say that at all. God's promised to meet our needs as we put him first. You think of uh, Philippians 4, chapter 4, verse 19, where Paul said, And my God will meet all of your needs, according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. God has promised to meet needs, but not necessarily wants and desires. And many Christians have to pray, um, communicate, discuss it with their spouse as to what is a need and what's a want and desire. Because so often today, so many people believe that some things which are really wants and desires are absolute necessities, and they're not, many times. And I do believe, I'm not a doom and gloomer, I do believe that God can and sometimes meet our wants and desires, but I believe he does that with cash because throughout Scripture, God discourages debt. He warns of the dangers of debt. So I don't believe God's going to encourage a Christian to take on debt in order to buy something that they really don't need. Uh, I don't think so. You'd, you'd have to be get such clear direction from the Lord to do that, but generally speaking, I'd say the answer is no. It's interesting to note that when I provide financial counsel to an individual or couple, I often encourage them to review their credit card statements, bank statements, etc. over the last couple of years and identify those purchases that were wants and desires as opposed to needs. Often a significant portion of the accumulated debt was unnecessary. In 1 Tim Timothy 6, Paul said, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we shall take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. God wants us to be content. With, with our needs. And if he provides more, praise God. But generally speaking, we need to be content in, in just um, living with needs. So if you're watching the show and you and your spouse are in serious trouble because of mismanagement of money, you're in serious trouble anyway, I'd recommend that you both learn God's way of managing money. That would include the following. I'm going to give you five key points here. This is an overview. More uh, information can be found on our website, copelandfinancialministries.org. Um, but uh, the first I'd say is study God's word on finances. In 2 Timothy 3, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Uh, why study God's word on finances? Because most Christians are violating biblical financial principles unknowingly. They don't know what it 
is there's about 2,300 script references in the Bible to money and material things. Only about 3% deal with um, giving. And generally giving is about the only area that churches tend to talk about on finances. There's 97% there that often is not taught in the local church, at least in many local churches. It's taught in some, but not many. Number two, develop and implement a budget or a spending plan to ensure you have a surplus each month in order to pay down debt. Managing your monthly cash flow is really critical. So often, people are buying money on credit cards or whatever lines of credit, and they're spending a little more than they're making each month, and they're accumulating debt rather than accumulating savings, which they need for things like retirement, kids' education, and also to pay down debt. So you've got to make sure that you spend less than you earn and you have a surplus to pay down debt. Number three, obtain biblical financial counsel. Proverbs 15.22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. Number four, meditate on key scriptures so that God, through His Word and His Spirit, can change the way you think about money and material things. Uh, just uh, meditate on some key scriptures. Get into the habit of, um, if, when, you, when you're reading God's Word and God highlights for you some scripture, why don't you write them down, uh, keep them on a sheet like I do in the back of my... Uh, wallet and then look at them several times a day and you know what by the end of the week uh, you, you, as you pray over them and you, you meditate on them you got to memorize now the key is not memorizing them but rather you want to program them into your brain so you start to think the way God thinks about managing money so that's what you want to do and number five remember honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops then your barns will be filled to overflowing your vats will brim over with new wine in other words even when you're in debt you actually have a dual responsibility. You've got a responsibility to pay down the debt. Romans 13, 8 says, let no debt remain outstanding. But you also have a responsibility to give to God's work. So do not defer or neglect giving to God's work uh, when you're in debt. You need to still give something. The tithe is a guideline. It's not a legalism. But do give something to God's work as the Lord uh, directs you. Uh, since 1982, I've provided biblical financial counsel to uh, thousands of couples who followed God's financial principles. And I can say that when they do that, there's many real-life examples. There, there's so much blessings that God provides when we do things His way. And here's a real-life example, a typical one. Several years ago, a pastor called me indicating he had been counseling a couple whose marriage was in serious trouble. They had already separated, and he told me straight up he did not think the marriage could be saved. But he did notice that finances was one major area that they argued about frequently. So he referred me to... So they referred them to me for some biblically-based financial counsel. Here's what happened. I connected with this couple. They explained their financial problems and some of their relationship problems, which I didn't ask about, but they did explain some of the relationship problems. So what did I do? I did what I usually do. I focused on the financial issues. I taught them God's way of managing money. I helped them develop and implement a budget, and I recommended that they meditate on certain scriptures that related to some of the financial areas that they were struggling with. This was in order to change the way they think about money and material things. Over the next year, they went through my in-depth biblical financial study, Financial Management God's Way, and God, through His Word and His Spirit, enabled them to change the way they think about and manage money. By the way, it was God who did that. It wasn't me. I just gave them the biblical instruction. Here's what's interesting. About one year later, I received an email from the husband who thanked me for the financial advice. He explained that they had learned and applied God's financial principles, which relieved significant financial stress, and he thanked me for that. Frankly, I thought that would be the end of the, his comments, but instead the husband went on and emphasized strongly that their marriage relationship had healed and they had fallen in love again. And that was just a touching thing. And I've seen that in many other cases. Many other cases when God's people learn God's way of managing money, not only can the financial problems be resolved, but generally speaking, the marriage relationship can be restored. And remember, we're talking about a couple here who had already separated. And the relationship got restored, they got back together, and they fell in love again. And that's possible. But in those cases where finances is a major stress between husband and wife, um, if they learn and apply God's financial principles, it, I've seen many marriage relationships healed, uh, especially after the financial stresses were, were relieved. And what's interesting, in this case that I mentioned, and all the other cases that, that I've seen where God's done incredible things, I only provided biblically-based financial advice. I did not provide any marriage counseling. I'm not a marriage counselor. I'm a, I'm a chartered accountant by profession. So, The next thing I like to talk about is um, most people buy things they don't need and accumulate debt and eventually suffer the consequences. And uh, in order to avoid your area of financial temptation, everybody has an area of financial temptation. That's an area where they, they're tempted to spend money and, and they know they shouldn't. Uh, I would encourage you to meditate on 1 Corinthians 10.13 where Paul said, No temptation has seized you 
except what is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, God will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. In other words, everyone needs to identify their area of temptation and avoid those temptations. For example, if he's a tool guy, avoid the hardware store. And if he's a car guy or if it's a car girl, do not check out the vehicles at the local dealership. Or if you have to get a new vehicle, it really is wearing out and you've got a couple hundred thousand kilometers on it and it's really wearing out, you've got to get a new one. Get someone to go with you so you're not tempted into buying something more than what you can afford. And of course, have a budget beforehand and know what you can afford. And for the woman who spends unnecessarily at the shopping mall, don't go there. And if for some reason you really have to go there, uh, have a list, focus on what you need, purchase what you need, uh, and leave the shopping mall. Don't do any window shopping. In other words, avoid your area of temptation. That's what the key is. Identify it and avoid it. And for everyone, if you've bought things on credit cards that you did not need, you could not afford, then perform plastic surgery by cutting them up. Another option, by the way, to avoid getting into debt is to use a debit card and just restrict the amount of money that's in your account because once your uh, account is run dry, you can't use your debit card anymore. So that puts a, um, a control in place there. In Hebrews 13.5, Jesus said, Be content with what you have. And in Luke 3.14, John the Baptist said, Be content with your pay. So people need to, lead to learn to be content with what God has provided to them. So often, people need to change the way they think about money and material things. And the best way to do that is to follow Paul's instructions in Romans 12, 2, which says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, how do you renew your mind? Joshua 1, 8 gives the answers. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so you may be careful to do everything written in it. And by the way, that scripture goes on to say, then you will be prosperous and successful. Um, God will bless as we meditate on his word and we do things his way. Now that prosperity and, and, and success may not necessarily be financial blessings. It could well be. I've seen that many times. But uh, rather, God can bless you with um, contentment in being his will. He can bless your ministry that you're involved in, leading people to Christ. He can provide you with his peace that surpasses all understanding. He can bless you with an excellent marriage relationship, good rapport and relationship with your kids. He can bless you in many ways as you meditate on his word and follow his will, uh, many ways beyond the financial, although he can do the financial as well. And I think of Hebrews 4.12, which I, I quote often, uh, where it says, the, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrows. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. God's word is powerful. It's truth. Jesus said in John 8, 32 to his disciples, um, if you follow my teaching, you are truly my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Truth sets us free from the financial deceptions of this world, and there's lots of financial deceptions. If you go to my uh, chapter on financial deceptions in my book, Financial Management God's Way, you can learn more about that. It's available on the website, but there's lots of financial deceptions that uh, people believe in this world. And frankly, when people study God's word on finances and meditate on the scriptures, and especially in areas where they have problems, God through his word and his spirit can change their mindset from a worldly perspective to a godly perspective, which will result in them managing money God's way. For example, if lack of contentment or selfishness is an issue, which is very common, then they should meditate on something like Philippians 4, 11 to 13, where Paul said, for I've learned to be content. Notice Paul had to learn to be content. We know how committed he was. For I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So he's saying I, that he's learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. At this point, you may be thinking, what was Paul's secret to learning contentment? Paul learned to be content by focusing on his relationship with Jesus Christ and things of eternal value. When you do this, money and material things, which are very temporary, will become much less important in your life, and the tendency to buy things you don't need will often dissipate. For example, um, if you focus on the salvation of people, if you're praying for people's salvation and you're witnessing to them, and that's one of your main focuses and your concern, maybe you're ministering to your kids or whatever, or to other family members or friends or whatever, that's, that's so important. But if your focus and your attention is on how can I get that nicer car, how can I buy the bigger house, or how can I get those nicer clothes, or whatever it is, if it's, if it's focused on material things, then that's where your heart's going to be. 
Jesus talked about where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Next thing I'd like to talk about is over the years, I've noticed that some married couples keep their money separate. In other words, they start to think of it in terms of his money and what she earns is her money. Um, you may be thinking, is this a biblical approach? And generally the answer is no. From a biblical perspective, God wants husband and wife to be one flesh, Genesis 2.24, which would imply that God wants husband and wives to see their earnings as our money, not his money or her money. As well as putting all of the earnings into a joint bank account, as a team, a husband and wife should develop and implement a spending plan or budget together. They need to do that as a team to agree on it and then follow up on it together. The only exception to putting your money together is if one spouse is really irresponsible with money. For example, if one spouse buys things they don't need, accumulates significant debts to the point where critical payments such as your mortgage payment, utility payments, etc. have not or could be missed as a result of the mismanagement of money, then it may be necessary for the responsible spouse who manages money God's way to take control of the finances, deposit their paycheck into their own account to ensure that the bills are paid and that the needs of the family are met and to ensure that you don't lose your home because once you lose your home it creates incredible instability for the, uh, the, the kids, the family as a whole and often it results, well it's going to result in, in stressing the marriage relationship and sometimes even separation and divorce but that doesn't have to happen if both husband and wife learn and manage money God's way. And by the way, generally, I encourage married couples to disclose their spending to each other. Uh, I see many situations where one spouse spends unnecessarily and accumulates debts on several credit cards without their spouse's knowledge. But however, when the couple goes to renew their mortgage, the bank does its normal standard credit check, and it turns out that their mortgage renewal is um, turned down because the irresponsible spouse has a bad credit rating. Uh, husband and wives, you need to be totally open and honest about where you're spending money. That should be disclosed. I'm going to suggest form number six of the Copeland Budgeting System. It's available from our website. It's a download Excel data file. It's free. Um, you, need to dis you need to track your expenses. Disclose it to each other because often when you track it, you'll spend less. And I, I'd just like to say this last point. Hidden debts will destroy the trust between a husband and wife, which is so critical for a good marriage relationship. Proverbs 12.13 says, Lies will get any man or woman into trouble, but honesty is its own defense. So you want to be totally open and honest and disclose where you're spending money. Now let's suppose you're single, but you're planning to get married. Here's some biblical advice so you can avoid a lot of these financial problems and corresponding relationship problems. First of all, before couples get married, I strongly recommend that they have an open and honest conversation about the lifestyle expectations, uh, what they're expecting, where they think, where they plan to live, how many cars they will drive, vacations, uh, how many times they're going to eat out. Actually, develop a budget uh, together on what, you, what your expenditures are going to be, and then determine if you're going to have enough income. Is it realistic? Can you afford it? Because often people are idealistic. They want to live a certain lifestyle, but they don't have the income. One place to start is to develop a budget for the wedding costs and the honeymoon and determine where the funds are going to come from. For engaged couples, I encourage you to fully disclose your debts to each other as debt surprises after the wedding day can cause tremendous relationship problems as one spouse may feel betrayed by the other spouse who has brought a lot of debt into the marriage. So um, in my experience, most couples do not discuss finances at any death before marriage. Um, they believe their love for each other will overcome any potential problems that they face, but unfortunately this is generally idealistic. It's, it's not realistic. I think of a young man when I spoke at a group one time, he came up to me afterwards and he says, listen, I'm, en I'm engaged to my girlfriend. I think what you're telling me is I can't marry her until I get rid of my debts. Uh, and I said, no, that's not the case, but you do have to disclose your debts to her so she understands what, what, she's, uh, what she's taking on here because when you get married, her debts, your debts become her debts and vice versa. He says, well, I can't disclose that. It's embarrassing. I said, it's better to be embarrassed now than be embarrassed later because later it's going to cause a whole lot more problem and friction in the relationship. And it's actually a bit deceiving if you go ahead with the marriage and you bring a whole pile of debt into the marriage relationship that she's not aware of. And of course, it operates the other way around. If the, if the wife to be, the woman has a significant amount of debt, she should disclose that to her, her uh, male fiance. I've seen many situations where this situation arose and um, once, uh, for example, one, one situation with a, a young couple, they're engaged, the wife-to-be the wife noticed that he was spending money rather frivolously and he ran up a lot of credit cards. This really bothered him, bothered her. She talked to him about it. He wouldn't do anything about it. 
He believed their love for each other would overcome any problems that they might face. Um, and, and the bottom line was uh, she, she terminated the uh, marriage engagement. She called off the wedding. He was in tears. But the good news is this was a, an eye-opener for him. He took the time to learn God's way of managing money. Um, and uh, she actually ended up marrying him about a year later. And today this couple are teaching other young people how to manage money God's way. And if she hadn't have taken that bold step, and now sometimes it can be the other way, the, 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 man, the wife can be the one mismanaging money, but if, if you don't take that bold step, you can go into a marriage relationship and be stuck with their bad financial habits for the rest of your life and, uh, and just, just end up having, a, in some cases, a very difficult marriage because of that. So um, just keep that in, in mind. If you're engaged or considering engagement, I encourage you to watch my video titled Biblical Advice for Engaged Couple. It's, um, it's available from our website, copelandfinancialministry.org. Now I would like to speak to the parents about managing money. From four decades of experience, I can say this, that how parents manage money will likely have a very significant impact on how their children manage money. For example, if parents mismanage money, generally their kids will follow the same pattern when they become adults. I see this all the time because uh, I see about four to 500 people's finances every year. I've seen it and I've done, seen it for like about almost four decades. I see it all the time. Um, however, if parents manage money God's way and teach their kids how to manage money in a biblical fashion, then their kids will very likely follow their parents' example and uh, this will have a tremendous impact for their kids and which, by the way, indirectly will impact your grandkids as your kids teach their kids how to manage money. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. To learn more about God's Word on finances, go to our website, copelandfinancialministries.org. Access some of the resources. By the way, most of them are free. The first I'd say is watch the numerous financial moments on several topics. Join our financial moment email list. The financial moments a one-page summary of a biblical principle on finance. It's sent out about once a week. Um, three, download a free copy of the Copeland Budgeting System. It's available for free. And uh, watch the 30-minute video on how to use it. And for sure, go through the online interactive version of my in-depth study, Financial Management God's Way. This is the most um, in-depth study that I know of, of God's Word on finances. And this is the study where if people go through it, it's a commitment of about three to four hours a week for 12 weeks. It, it, it results in the most significant long-term change in the way people manage money. So again, our website, copelandfinancialministry.org. I would like to now um, close in prayer. Father, I pray that through your word and your spirit, that you would move in the hearts and the minds of everyone listening, Lord. I, I just pray, Lord, that uh, I trust uh, what it says in Isaiah 33, 11, that your word would not come back empty, but accomplish what you desire, Lord, and fulfill the purpose for which you sent it. And I pray that through your word and your spirit, you touch the, the, the hearts and minds of uh, the, the couples listening to this and understand that how they manage money unequivocally can impact their relationship with their spouse positively or negatively. So they would be so wise to learn and apply what you say, Lord, on finances. Father, I pray that everyone listening would follow up and do this. In Jesus' name, amen. To learn more, check out copelandfinancialministries.org.